You are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio. Our God is merciful and forgiving. Daniel chapter 9 verse 9 The following is entitled, Who Should God Forgive? Enjoy and have a glorious day. At one time or another, all of us have found ourselves needing to forgive someone. But sometimes it's hard to get to that point. It might be helpful to consider this much bigger question. Who should God forgive? And does his forgiveness make a difference in who I should forgive? You know, there was a day when Jesus wanted to pass through Samaria on his way to Jerusalem, and the people there were less than hospitable and wouldn't make a place for Jesus. And the Bible tells us that James and John, who were, by the way, called the sons of thunder by Jesus, and that sort of tells you that they were more than just a little hot-headed and less than merciful, the Bible says that James and John were instantly offended and said something like this, hey, Jesus, you don't have to put up with this. You want us to call down fire from heaven to burn them up? Well, it was James and John who Jesus dealt with that day, not the people of Samaria. Those two disciples were a lot like us, very easily offended and unforgiving, ready for God to judge someone else for their sins, but certainly wanting his mercy and forgiveness for ourselves. Today, we're going to look at the issue of forgiveness. So turn with me to the book of Jonah, chapters 3 and 4, and let's look at this question, who should God forgive? And then personally, who should you and I forgive? Three most liberating words in our language. I forgive you. So many of us are here today and we can thank God that we've heard those words spoken to our heart through Jesus Christ. And then God has given us grace to show his forgiveness to others. When we've been hurt, when we've been injured, to come to someone and even through the pain to be able to say, I forgive you. But the question sometimes rises in our hearts and our minds, who should we forgive? Who should God forgive? Is there anybody that's outside of the scope of his forgiveness? Of course, the truth is God wants us to have hearts that reach out with forgiveness to everyone just as his heart does. James Garfield was elected to be president of the United States in 1880. And he had been president just for six months when something tragic happened to him. He was a godly man. He was a lay preacher before he became president, served as president of a Bible college, a Bible school of Greek and Latin scholar. He was so smart that he could write at the same time. With one hand, he could write Latin, and the other, he could write Greek and translate what he was writing. I don't know how like, I could do that, but he was just writing on a, on a chalkboard at one time. That's how smart he was, and great, great godly man with a heart and a mind for God. But six months into his presidency, somebody shot James Garfield in the back with a revolver. He remained conscious, never lost consciousness. They took him to the hospital. A doctor there tried to dig out the bullet using his little finger, could not find the bullet. Then he had a silver-tipped probe that he was using, tried to probe it out to get it out that way, could not find the bullet. Garfield went back to uh, D.C. And, and got there, and they tried to give him some comfort and rest, but he just, he could not rest. He got weaker and weaker. Doctors examined him one after the other, did test after test, just trying to find that bullet. They couldn't find it. They called Alexander Graham Bell, who was trying to invent the telephone. They asked him to come in as an expert to see if he could find the uh, bullet. He could not find the bullet, and Garfield was getting worse and worse. He was able to survive through July, through August, but in September of that year, he died. And after he died, here's what they determined. He died not as a result of that bullet, but as a result of the infection that had come from probing around trying to get it. Now, the truth is there are things that people will do to us, things that people will say to us that sometimes will hit us like a bullet in the back, hurtful things things that really wound us. But the truth is this. When we hold on to unforgiveness and resentment in our hearts, 
It can poison and infect us spiritually even more than the injury or the wound that someone else has done to us. That's why it's so important for us as followers of Jesus Christ to have forgiving spirits that reach out to people with a heart of restoration and forgiveness. That's God's heart, and we see that today in the book of Jonah. So take your Bibles and look with me in Jonah chapters 3 and 4 as we ask the question, who should God forgive? We're going to read the first four verses of Jonah chapter 3 together, but then keep your Bibles open because throughout this message, I'll be walking you through both of these chapters as we finish up the book of Jonah. Look what the Bible says in verse 1 of Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Let's just stop right there. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Look back up in verse 1 of chapter 1, and notice what it says there. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. You know, after everything, after Jonah ran away from God, after God sent a storm on the sea in the boat where Jonah was trying to escape, after God caused a a giant fish to swallow up Jonah and to spare his life, after all of those things, it's like in chapter 3, God just hits the rewind button and takes you all the way back to where he started in chapter 1, verse 1. He comes back to Jonah the second time, and he brings him the same message that he brought him the first time. Notice what it says. He came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city. Call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. This is the word of God. Will you join with me as we pray? Lord God, I pray that you would move me out of the way and that you would speak. God, help people today to hear your heart of forgiveness. Lord, there's some in this room who need to come to you to experience your forgiveness. Some who have never been saved, who today you are just calling them to yourself to experience the forgiveness and life that Jesus alone can give. Some, Lord, who have been saved, but God, they've been walking at a guilty distance from you. The day you're calling them to to turn back to you so that they can be forgiven. Some in this room, God, who are carrying with them the baggage and the guilt of the past, which you've already forgiven them of. And today, God, they need your grace so they can forgive themselves. And then, Lord, there's some here today who need to forgive someone else. So, God, we thank you that your grace that forgives us also empowers us to forgive others. Teach us today from your word. For we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Who should God forgive? That was the question that Jonah was wrestling with really through both of these chapters. Now, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture. And as we do, I want you to think with me about four things, four things that happened in these chapters. First of all, think with me about the message Jonah delivered. The message that Jonah delivered. The Bible says that that God came to Jonah a second time and sent him back to Nineveh. And this time, Jonah obeyed God and delivered the message. Now, as we think about missions and taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth and to the nations, I'm reminded the book of Jonah is a missionary book. Jonah, in, in, in a way that really no other prophet was, was a missionary prophet. He was not sent to Israel. He was not sent to Judah, as most of the prophets were. He was sent far away, 550 miles away, to the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. He was a foreign missionary sent out by God. And Nineveh was far. It was far from Israel, but more than that, it was far from God. The people were terribly wicked. And, and so God sent Jonah to Nineveh. And notice what the Bible says in verse 3. It says, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. The Bible says that, verse, verse 4 says, he gets about one day's journey, about a third of the way into the city. And he gets there into a populated area, and I don't know what he did, I don't know what he looked like, I don't know if he met with some of the officials or some of the leaders, I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us. We know that he probably looked different. Some people have speculated that his 
skin would have been bleached as a result of the Mediterranean cruise he had just been on in the gastrointestinal system of a great fish. I don't know if he looked different. We don't know. But certainly his language would have been different and his clothing as a Hebrew would have been different. But he gets a day's journey into the city and he begins to preach the message. Now, in English, it's eight words in my Bible. In Hebrew, it's five words. But the message is this, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. In 40 days, he said, God is going to overthrow this city. The word overthrow means to destroy or demolish. And I can see him all throughout the area showing up and warning the people of God's judgment. I can see him standing out in front of the West Nineveh Starbucks with a cafe latte in his hand. And as young Ninevite millennials are coming out of the Starbucks, he's saying, yet 33 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I can see him out on the sidewalk of the Nineveh Publix on a Saturday morning. And he's there and people think that he's just one of these guys trying to raise money for his kids' little league team so that they can go wherever they're playing. They're always there in front of Publix on Saturday mornings. Anyway, and so he's there and people are coming by with their families after grocery shopping. And he's saying, yet 25 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I can see him rocking in a rocking chair on the front porch of the South Nineveh Cracker Barrel Restaurant, talking to senior adults from Nineveh and saying, yet nine days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Over and over and over again, he sounded that message. And I want you to hear what this message was. It was a hard message from a loving God. God loves us enough to warn us against sin. God loves us enough, not just to warn us against sin, but to warn us against sin in time for us to repent. You know, sometimes, so many times when you watch an action movie and the hero runs into the place where there's the ticking time bomb, so many times it's got like 10 seconds and it's counting down and you think he's not going to be able to make it. That's not what God did here. God didn't just give them one day. He gave them 40 Days. It was a, a kind message. It was a hard message. It was a patient message. But listen to me say this. It was an urgent message. God's given us a message to proclaim. And it's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the message that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for sin. It's the message that Jesus rose from the grave to give eternal life. It's the message that People without Christ are dead and facing God's eternal judgment because of sin. But if they turn to Jesus, they can be saved. It's a hard message, but it's a loving message, and it's an urgent message. Friends, it's an urgent message for us to share, and it's an urgent message for people to hear and to obey. Some of you are here, and you've been putting off God all your life. Really. You've been putting him off. And you think to yourself somewhere in your heart, I've got plenty of time. No, listen, you don't know if you've got 40 days. You don't know if you've got 39 days. You don't know if you've got 10 years. You don't know if you've got five days. You don't know how long it will be until you stand face to face before the God who made you to give an account for your life. And he's going to be asking this one thing, what have you done with his son, Jesus Christ? You know, the Bible tells us that God is patient. The Word of God says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God does not wish for anyone to face eternal hell because of your sin. He's patient with you. He's not being slow. He's not being lax. He's going to keep his promise to judge the earth and to judge every person individually. But he's patient enough to give people the opportunity to turn to Jesus and to be saved. I was talking to a fireman this week, and and he said something to me. He said, you know, he said, when I get a call to a house that's on fire, and I'm standing out in front of that house, 
And I'm trying to decide what I need to do, what's the best way, the, what's the best way for me to put out that fire. He said, as long as I'm standing there trying to make the decision about the best way to put out that fire, the house is still burning down. Some of you are waiting to figure out the absolute best way to share Jesus with someone, and the house is burning down. Some of you are here waiting for the best time, the appropriate time, the time when everything's going to be right in your life to come to Jesus Christ. The problem is the house is burning down. It's an urgent message that God gives, and that's the kind of message that Jonah delivered here he brought an urgent message then secondly i want you to think about this think with me about the mercy god extended look in verses 5 through 10 verses 5 through 10 tells us what happened when jonah began to preach his message verse 5 says this and the people of nineveh believed god they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published throughout Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil ways and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. The Bible says that the people of Nineveh heard the message that Jonah was proclaiming and they believed God. Eventually, the message got all the way up to the king. Now, he's called the king of Nineveh here. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, so in all likelihood, this is the king of the whole empire of Assyria. To me, it's almost comical the way he responds. I mean, it it shows that he, he didn't know much about God, but he was doing everything he could do. And so he hears about it. And people out in the city are already putting on sackcloth, sort of like these burlap uh, clothing that they were putting on. It was the clothing of, of a slave to show that they, they were servants of God. They didn't know much about God. They just knew they wanted to serve him and not be judged by him. And they were going without food as a way of humbling themselves before God. They were fasting before God. But the king hears about it, and the Bible says that the king and his nobles issued an edict. And I almost think about the king there talking to one of his nobles, dictating the edict about what he wanted the people to do. And he's standing there and says, all right, I'm the king. I've heard we're facing some trouble. We need to do something different. Write this down. Everybody in the kingdom needs to go without food or drink. Fisher writes that down. He says, the cows too. Fisher says, cows too. Shut up. Write it down. The cows, too, everybody. And I want everybody to put on, put on sackcloth. I want everybody everywhere draped with sackcloth. The cows, too. You want, you want the cows to put on? We don't even have that much burlap to put on the cows. Shut up. Write it down. Now, listen. He's doing everything he knows to do, even though he knows very little. He's doing everything he knows to do to get himself and his nation right with God. You are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio.